Hi, my name is Kanaka Rajan. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Neuroscience at Mount Sinai, and I'd like to welcome you to this year's uh, co-sign tutorial. I am going to talk about what we can learn about the brain from recurrent neural networks. And so just briefly before I dive into the, into the lecture, here's going to be the lesson plan for today. In lecture one, I'm going to be giving you an intuition for what the fundamental or foundational elements are that go into building recurrent neural network models. The goal for us in the first, first half of, um, of today's tutorial is going to be to take away from this the idea that recurrent neural network models are extremely tractable, yet super rich. So what you can get from them are these rich dynamics dynamics, um, internally generated dynamics, that are actually the foundation of neural circuits that you see in the brain. And that's probably why they make such good models of, um, of neural function. In the second lecture, we're going to be talking about some of the ways in which recurrent neural network models have been applied profitably for mechanistic discovery in neuroscience. I'm going to be talking about a few examples, um, both from my lab as well as um, some hits you may have seen in, in literature. So the overall big picture here is that together, you and I are going to be writing a theory of cognition as dynamics. Um, and so what we're going to do is to try and put together the building blocks of such a theory. And the intuition that I want everyone to take away from this is that cognitive actions, behaviors, processing of all of those things is just dynamic. So cognition is fundamentally dynamic. It unfolds over time. It has these complicated um, and rich dynamics um, that are you know, unfolding over a variety of spatiotemporal scales. But as you can see from this um, video of Octopus Heidi having herself a nice dream, you can see that indeed uh, there's a lot of cognitive processing that is unfolding over time. It's rich and complex and fundamentally dynamic. There are many models, however, that look at feed-forward interactions in the brain. So they focus on uh, interactions such as, um, you know, excitation flowing unidirectionally from one active um, brain region to the other or in a layered manner. And indeed, if Heidi the octopus were to recognize a crab relatively quickly, if this was a visual recognition kind of task, this model is perfectly valid and works um, quite profitably, as you can see in, um, in many papers from from numerous labs that have done a beautiful um, work on this. However, if you're starting to think about Heidi the octopus, learning, remembering, or thinking about the, about the crab, if she's thinking about, well, you know, is this a crab versus a not crab? Is this a crab that's occluded, or is it a crab that's moving? Or even Heidi the octopus having herself a dream about these crabs, then the neural circuits in the brain that are responsible for this learning, remembering, and thinking all have internally generated dynamics. And the key feature of these internally generated dynamics is that they come from both feedback and feedforward interactions, or in other words, recurrent neural dynamics. And so RNNs, or recurrent neural networks, which you will see me referring to throughout this talk, capture both feedforward and feedback interactions. And there's several labs, as I have shown you here in the slide, that work on this. Remember what we want these networks to be able to do, this class of RNN models, is to train them or change them or modify them in some way in order to, to make like a function that the brain does, right? We want them to look like they're task specialized. We want them to be able to, you know, indeed have the spatiotemporal richness of Heidi the octopus dreaming. But before we get into those types of things, what we, it's useful for us to understand some of the general properties or learn the vocabulary of some of the building blocks of these RNN models models. And that's what we're going to visit together here. And so there's, you know, two fundamental elements that form this, uh, form a gen generic recurrent neural network model. And they all have model neuron-like units, and they have activation functions. So model neuron-like units are abstractions that say they can be discrete time, they can be continuous dynamics, they can be rate-based, which means that every unit, instead of making a digital one zero electrical spike, has a continuous analog output. They can also be gated. What we're going to be talking about are continuous dynamics and rate-based models for today, uh, because I want to tell you about some of the tractability of models like this. And indeed, the richer models are totally possible. 
The second uh, fundamental element of RNN models is the activation function. And what the activation function does is take the inputs or the currents to each of these model units, neuron-like units, and produce an output, which can be rate-based, like we're going to see. They can be spikes also. And activation functions are you know, variably known as response functions. They can be called transfer functions. Electrophysiologists amongst you might call them FI curves or frequency current curves. And activation functions can be linear, they can be nonlinear, and within nonlinear ones, they can be uh, you know, hyperbolic tangents, which I will sometimes refer to as tanch here, uh, written here in the slide as a tan h. They can be ReLU or rectified linear units, which many of you might recognize from machine learning courses. They can be piecewise linear. They can be sigmoids. What we're going to be talking about today will be in the category of linear versus nonlinear activation functions. And within nonlinear activation functions, we're going to be restricting ourselves to the tanch or the hyperbolic tangent. And the reason reasons for this will become clear. But once again, remember what we're after is to understand some of the vocabulary that goes into RNNs and therefore to appreciate the tractability of RNNs and to understand why they make such a good model for dynamics that occur in the brain. The third fundamental element of recurrent neural network models are interactions, which is to say, well, how is every model unit, model neuron-like unit connected to every model neuron-like unit? And within interactions, they can be you know, fully connected, where every unit really does fundamentally talk to every other unit in this model. They can be sparse. They can also be structured. And indeed, Brent Duaron has done some beautiful work on structured networks, where you know, recurrent neural network models can look like you know, multiple regions. They can look like there's a distance dependent, um, dependent change in the connectivity. We're going to be, for simplicity's sake, stick to fully connected networks where every model neuron-like unit talks to every other model neuron-like unit, and feedback and feedforward connections are both possible. These are the fundamental elements that we're going to be playing with today. Uh, think of them as Lego blocks, and let's see what these models can do. So, you know, if you have a single model neuron, here I've written down one that I've called I, and that's just sitting in a bath of other neurons, the current in a model neuron is essentially what happens when there's a neurotransmitter release, right? Neurotransmitters come into this bath, channels open in the cell, and, a num and you know, current flows into the cell. That current in this model neuron can be described by a linear first order differential equation of this form. The solution to this differential equation is, you know, x of t. What I've written down is dx dt for that neuron i with a leak, which is what the negative sign is, is xi, right? And so what happens to that neuron is it exhibits decaying activity. So if x at time 0 is 1, then all the neuron does is decay its activity down to 0. Now, when you're building neuron-like model units, you can also introduce a time dependence to this, right? You can control how fast this current decays to 0 by introducing this letter tau to the front of this ordinary differential equation. And so that controls how fast this decays. It's still an exponential decline to 0 at long term, but you've now introduced the concept of a synaptic time constant. There's a few other things these models can do, but just as an aside, imagine that this neuron did not have a leak. It didn't have a decaying, um, decaying time course. Instead, all I've replaced on the right-hand side of the equation is, is, um, is xi with a plus sign. That neuron can be unstable. So what happens to that neuron is that it exponentially diverges at long term. So this is an aside that we'll return to. Linear models can do only two things. They can either decline to 0, decay to 0 at long term, which is sometimes called a trivial fixed point, or they can explode and become unstable. And we will return to this even when we're talking about neurons that are sitting not dissociated like you see in the schematic, but within the context of a network. So how do you keep the activity of the, of the neuron from decaying to 0? We can introduce the concept of an input. So let's say that instead of you know, just leaking, this neuron received a constant input, which I'm calling x um, i here for that, for that particular neuron. So instead of decaying to 0, that neuron decays its activity with the same time constant as it, as it did before. But instead of decaying to 0, it goes to a different um, constant value at the end. Now imagine that instead of receiving a constant input, this neuron was connected in a recurrent manner. 
And now we're starting to make the transition from something that is feed forward to something that is recurrent. So imagine this neuron is sitting in a, in, instead of being you know, dissociated in a bath or just being driven by constant input, is actually sitting inside a fully connected or recurrent neural network. So it has the exact same equation that you saw one slide ago, except now, instead of a constant current, its activity is driven by everyone else it's connected to. So that neuron's activity is actually the sum of everyone else's current, which is basically all the j's, the x j's that it's connected to, weighted by how strongly each neuron is coupled to it. And that's what the term j i j does. So now we've built ourselves a linear recurrent neural network model in which it's the activity of each neuron is given by the activity of everyone else or the current from everyone else weighted by how strongly they're coupled to one another. So the key thing to remember going from the previous formalism of a single neuron to this, um, to this neuron that is sitting in a recurrent network is the elements of this matrix J, which are the recurrent interactions. Now, if there's n neurons in this recurrent neural network model, and I'm calling this a fully connected recurrent neural network model, everyone is connected to everyone else. So these recurrent weights can be succinctly mathematically described by this matrix, which contains n squared elements because everyone is fully connected to everyone else. So the columns of this matrix will be the sources or the presynaptic units, which are, the, which are indexed by the letter J. And the rows are the targets or the postsynaptic units in this RNN. And those are indexed by the letter I. Linear recurrent neural networks, networks also have stable or unstable activity patterns, very similar to what we saw before, except now they have a slight twist. So there are stable patterns and unstable patterns. And exactly as we saw in the single dissociated neuron case, stable patterns decay to zero. So here is the firing rate of a single neuron in a fully connected linear RNN. And as you can see, over long term, its activity decays to zero or goes to a, a trivial fixed point. The only difference in going from a single neuron dissociated in a linear regime to one that is in a fully connected RNN is that some of these modes also oscillate or wiggle with different frequencies before they go to zero. So here's an example, and here's another example. So this is like a damped tennis ball. And you can see that different uh, different modes will oscillate to different rates, but eventually they all decay away to zero. The unstable patterns in a linear RNN all blow up. So what you can see here is a single linear, um, single mode, a single firing rate plotted as a function of time, and it explodes. And exactly like the, st uh, like the stable ones did, they also oscillate with different frequencies before exploding. So here's two modes that I'm showing you here, one that oscillated with a, with a smaller frequency and one with a larger frequency. Linear recurrent neural network models, therefore, also have stable or unstable patterns. The stable patterns are all transient, and they all go to a trivial fixed point. The unstable ones are uncontrollable. Except with extreme fine tuning, you can't get any other behavior from linear recurrent neural networks. We're trying to write down together a theory of cognitionless dynamics. So where are we, right? We've discussed linear recurrent neural network models, and I'm now writing down the same equation, dx dt as x dot is minus x plus the input, which is everyone else's current weighted by how strongly they're coupled to me. And what we've seen is that linear recurrent neural network models, with a few notable exceptions, have two activity patterns. They can, there's a stable one that decays to zero or goes to a trivial fixed point. And then the one that is, does not decay is unstable or blows up. So basically what we've done is built the model like a light bulb that, in which the activity that does not decay is unstable or blows up. So how do we tame this instability, right? We want this network to be able to generate activity patterns that are stable and ongoing. And so what we want to do first is to introduce the concept of nonlinearities. And then we want to see if that tames this instability. So we want to go from linear to nonlinear dynamics, and I want to introduce the concept of an um, activation function. So we've seen this equation before, where, the, where the, um, the current in my model neuron is a function of the presynaptic current of everyone else, weighted by how strongly they're coupled to me. However, it stands to reason that my currents are really a function of the outputs or the firing rates produced by everyone that is connected to me in this recurrent um, neural network model.
And so we want to introduce a hyperbolic tangent here, which is our activation function of choice, that takes this linear quantity and transforms it into an output or a firing rate, which is what you see here plotted. So here, the output rate as a function of the input current has this nonlinear form. The, um, the activation function hyperbolic tangent goes from minus 1 to plus 1. Yes, negative firing rates are problematic. Um, and there's, um, there's ways of countering that, but we want to consider them as though they are relative to some kind of background. And so how does that modify this equation, right? So if we make the currents a function of the presynaptic firing rate, then the equation gets modified to introduce this nonlinearity where dx dt is now a function of phi of xj, which are the presynaptic firing rates rather than the presynaptic currents. Now, in cases when there's weak current, um, weak current, then these two will become equivalent. And when currents are stronger, then the nonlinearity keeps this network from exploding. And we'll look at that in a second. So in nonlinear recurrent neural network models, which is where we are, note that we've written down the phi of xj in the right-hand side of this equation. Activity patterns are either transient or ongoing. And transient activity patterns behave exactly like they did in the linear case, in that I'm showing you three different uh, firing rates from neurons in this particular network. And they decay to 0 or go to the trivial fixed point at long term, except they can wiggle on the way to going towards a trivial fixed point. Or they can be persistent or ongoing. What that means is that they can go to a fixed value of the firing rate, which is called a fixed point. And in this case, it's a non-trivial fixed point because it's at a non-zero value. Or they can oscillate and be ongoing all the time. Or they can have rich ongoing spontaneous activity that is also internally generated. So in nonlinear recurrent neural network models, the dynamical patterns, rather than being trivial or, or exploding, become transient or ongoing. So where are we, right? Our building blocks, or the Lego blocks, have assembled a nonlinear recurrent neural network model. We've talked about activation functions that, uh, that produce a firing rate from an, from an input current. We've talked about the hyperbolic tangent. Now, it turns out that the key thing to understand how networks like this will behave is looking at the properties of these recurrent weights, or the entries of this connectivity matrix J. Now, remember where we're going, right? We want to build, build a network model of Heidi in all of her dreaming glory, right? We want to be able to change the properties of these connectivity matrices so that they become task specialized or start to look like um, things that look like in the, in, the, in the real biological brain. However, it's very hard to make general statements about specialized matrices like this. There is, however, a class of matrices about which we can make such a general statement. And those are random matrices. So random connectivity matrix is one in which every element in this n squared sized matrix is drawn identically and independently from some probability distribution. And I'm showing you a Gaussian here. I'm showing you the probability density as a function of interaction strength. I've centered this Gaussian at 0. And so what that means is that the elements you can imagine that have positive values are excitatory. The elements that are negative valued are inhibitory. And this distribution can have a certain width that is given by g squared over n, where g can be thought of as a scaling factor. Now, I told you that we can think about general properties of nonlinear recurrent neural network models that have been connected through random recurrent interactions. And so some of those properties include trying to understand what types of activity patterns come out of, of networks that have been wired like this. So this is the same thing that you saw before. But now imagine we have a scenario in which some kind of biological mechanism has changed these interactions to be less wide or narrower. So rather than imagining a plasticity mechanism that would take this entire distribution and move it towards stronger values or weaker values, we have a, we have a biological mechanism that made these interactions less variable. So as variance of these interactions decreases, and I've picked one where that makes the g less than 1, 
or and and in this regime networks are sometimes called subcritical it turns out that the activity of models like this goes back to the trivial fixed point or it decays to zero or exhibits um, activity like this so here's the firing rate of a neuron in this uh, recurrent neural network model with nonlinear um, nonlinear activation function but connected with less variable random synapses and that has um, decaying activity now if I take the same um, same network and take the interactions and make them more variable or imagine a biological mechanism that took a few synapses over here and made them stronger another few synapses over here and make them weaker or in other words make this entire distribution broader in that case the network becomes super critical or becomes spontaneously active and exhibits rich and complex dynamics now, in the large n, n tends to infinity limit, some Polinsky, Crisanti, and Summers have shown that not only are networks like this spontaneously active, that activity is technically chaotic. And you can see that also in the population activity. So I'm showing you the activity of a few hundred neurons in a network like this as a function of time. And in an inactive case, you can see everyone is just at zero. However, just by changing the variability of the synapses, all we've done here is increase the variance of the synaptic strengths by widening this distribution. You get population activity that is rich and internally generated. So what are we saying, right? The effect of making interactions or recurrent interactions more variable has the effect of producing rich dynamics. So there's this one number in these models that if we change or increase, you get rich dynamics that are spontaneously produced from these models. And, and that makes them incredibly powerful. So there is a way to quantify how rich these population dynamics are with a metric that experimentalists can also use on their data, right? And that's the metric of the average autocorrelation. So it's a population-wide measure. And so what, how that is computed is just by looking at the uh, firing rate of everybody in this network at a certain time, multiplying it with their firing rate a certain time delay later, and then averaging over time and neurons. And that's what the angle braces in my equation symbolize. And so here's a GIF that was kindly provided by Sydney Smith, and she shows us exactly how such a metric is computed. So now we're going to look at what happens if we apply this average autocorrelation to population activity in the trivial or the inactive case, as well as the spontaneously active case. So this, most of the slide is what you've seen before, except now I'm going to apply this average autocorrelation to population dynamics that you saw two slides ago. So in the inactive case, when the network is subcritical or the synaptic interactions are not as variable, you can see that C of tau as a function of the delays is at zero, which is to be expected because all the firing rates are sitting at the trivial fixed point or are inactive. Now, in the spontaneously active case, when the network is supercritical or had variable recurrent interactions, the average autocorrelation as a function of the delay has this other interesting shape. So it has an initial high variability, and that is indicative of internally generated ongoing activity. And chaos in random recurrent networks was beautifully showed in this paper from uh, 1988 by Sompolinsky, Crisanti, and Summers. And we will return to this measure when we're talking about various regimes. So where are we, right? We saw, we initially looked at linear recurrent neural network models. We saw that, you know, they had two, two patterns, a stable one decayed to zero, and the activity that does not decay blows up. We tamed that instability by introducing the concept of nonlinearities, and we looked at the specific case of the hyperbolic tangent. And now you can see that you know, in nonlinear recurrent neural network models that have been connected with random recurrent interactions, we can tame this instability and get rich dynamics. And so are we done, right? Have we created a model in which there's spontaneous activity that is rich? Now the problem here is that the dynamics that we created are chaotic, which means that unless they are fine-tuned to an extremely high degree, you can't get reliably repeatable patterns from them. So if I were to use this network to do a task, every time I do the task, I will get a different activity pattern. So this is a problem. While we get rich dynamics, the patterns are not reliably repeatable. 
So what we're going to do with these models is, yes, eventually we're going to train them to do something task specific where this problem can be countered. But en route to it, we wanted to apply external inputs and see if we can get this problem under control. We want to return to our fundamental elements. And we've talked about model neuron-like units in the continuous rate-based dynamics case. We looked at the case of the hyperbolic tangent as the activation function. And we're talking about fully connected interactions. And now we want to add external inputs to this model. And external inputs can be periodic, they, as in sines and cosines. They can be noisy or they can be naturalistic, we're going to be considering periodic inputs for their mathematical tractability. So putting all the building blocks together, now we've added external inputs to these models. We've seen activation functions that took currents and turned them into firing rates. We also talked about a specific class of models for which we can really understand uh, the general properties and specifically the kinds of dynamics you can get from them. And now we want to introduce inputs to these models and see if we can improve their reliability somewhat. And I'm going to be talking about periodic inputs, which are cosines. What this means is that every unit in the model is going to get the same exact input with the same amplitude and frequency. However, everyone's going to get a slightly different phase. So what happens when you uh, put in inputs to these networks, right? So here's the activity of a nonlinear randomly connected recurrent neural network model with no input. This is the firing rate of one neuron in such a model over a function of time. And you've seen this before. It produces rich activity. With weak input, you can see that the network you know, churns along, looking as though it's kind of ignored the input. But when the input exceeds a certain critical amplitude, what we have shown previously is that networks like this can undergo a phase transition in which they turn off their intrinsically generated spontaneous activity and become entrained to the frequency of the input. And this is something that is also visible when you look at the population-wide dynamics. So here is the input-free case where you can see spontaneous, rich, ongoing dynamics. And here is the case where, at a certain critical input amplitude, the network has turned off this intrinsic variability and becomes entrained to the frequency of the input. And you can see this ladder-like pattern in the population dynamics. Now, I'm keeping all of them at a random phase. Everyone's getting an input at a slightly different phase, which is why you don't see them exactly synced up. The really interesting dynamical regime here is the one in the middle, where inputs are not strong enough that the network has undergone this phase transition, but you're very close to it where there's input generated activity, but it's superimposed on rich, ongoing, spontaneous dynamics, which is very reminiscent of what occurs in neural circuits in the brain. Now I want to show you the result of applying this metric that we developed before, the average autocorrelation, on these types of dynamics. Now in the input-free case, c of tau as a function of tau, if you recall, had this initial high variability because the neurons are irregular relative to each other. And that was you know, a signature of this internally generated ongoing background activity. Now when the input uh, entrains the network, or the network undergoes a phase transition at the critical input amplitude, there is no intrinsic variability left anymore. And you can see that reflected in the c of tau as a function of tau, that even even at long delays, you see the, the average autocorrelation function oscillating with the frequency of the drive that this network was um, receiving. Now, in the intermediate regime, you see that at long term, it doesn't go to 0, but oscillates with the frequency of the input. But the amplitude of the oscillation in the autocorrelation measure is smaller than the initial variability at c of 0. And that is the internal noise. And I say that in air quotes because it's not stochastic additive noise, but internally generated background activity. That can be turned off as a function of, uh, of this phase transition. And at long term, the amplitude of c of tau can be thought of as a signal portion, or the portion of the intrinsic variability of these networks that come from the external drive. So it's possible to have a notion of signal and noise from these types of models that is actually empirically quantifiable. So let's look at what this phase transition does, right? So this is a phase transition between ongoing and input-driven dynamics. Um, and below this phase transition curve is where the network has ongoing dynamics that are rich and internally generated. 
But there is input-driven dynamics that rides on top of this rich ongoing background. Above this phase transition curve, the network turns off this intrinsic variability and becomes entrained to the frequency of the drive, which in this case is periodic. So this makes a few predictions, right? One of the things that one of the experimental predictions is if you fix the input frequency at a certain value, you should expect to cross this phase transition curve at some critical input amplitude if you dial up the input amplitude, right? And so that's what you're able to do by measuring the signal and noise um, features from this population metric C of tau as a function of tau. So here I'm plotting the response amplitude as a function of the amplitude of the input that is given to these networks. And you can see that the signal grows linearly, or the portion of the activity that was input generated grows linearly with input amplitude, which in itself is not surprising. But the more interesting dynamics are exhibited by the noise or the background, which has this interesting shape and goes to zero at a critical value of input amplitude, which you see in the closed circles here. The second prediction uh, that this phase transition curve makes is that if you keep the input amplitude fixed, but change the frequency of the input, you should expect to cross this phase transition curve twice. Or in other words, you should expect to see a range of input frequencies for which the network entrains to the frequency of the input by turning off its ongoing or intrinsic dynamics. And that's indeed what you see in, in, in simulations. So once again, the open circles are the signal or the portion of the activity that comes from the frequency of the input. And the more interesting uh, behavior is exhibited by this intrinsically generated ongoing activity, which I'm calling noise here, as a function of the frequency. And you see that there's a range of frequencies for which this noise value goes to zero. So what this means is that when inputs come into nonlinear recurrent neural networks like this, yes, they're still connected by random um, interaction weights, which we're going to change. It has also been shown empirically that the state of several cortical regions becomes more regular when they've been driven. And that's been shown in this paper, um, Churchland et al. in 2010, where, where it's been shown across multiple regions of the cortex that those states become more regular and therefore reliable, possibly, when driven. Now, if indeed this entra entraining or quenching of the intrinsically generated rich spontaneous background underlies this phenomenon, then with inputs, that is the reason we can get networks to do things. And this entrainment of these networks or the ability of neural circuits to be able to reconcile inputs with ongoing background activity is why we can get RNNs to do things. So what have I told you today? Uh, we talked about linear recurrent neural network models, uh, which had two activity patterns, a stable one that decays to zero or goes to a trivial fixed point. So we had the problem that we built a light bulb that didn't do anything or was off. Activity that does not blow up in linear recurrent neural network models blows up. How do we tame that instability? We introduce the concept of nonlinearities, which also biological neurons have. And we looked at the specific case of randomly connected nonlinear recurrent neural network models in which we were able to tame the instability of the linear case, and we were able to get rich patterns of activity from them. The problem there was that the dynamics that we got out of nonlinear networks was chaotic. And so we had a problem with getting reliably repeatable patterns of activity from them. Now, where we're going with this is to be able to do the best of both worlds, right? We want dynamics that are rich, and we want networks to be able to do tasks that are comparable to the experimental setting. So we want to improve the reliability of these models. And so en route to training networks to do those things, we looked at what happens if we drive these nonlinear recurrent neural network models in order to control the chaos. And so we found that if we drove nonlinear recurrent neural network models, we have this interesting regime where there's background activity that is ongoing and rich, but input-driven activity can ride on top of it. Without the chaotic insensitivity to initial conditions, we could get slightly more reliable activity patterns from them. Now are we done, right? Have we solved the problem? 
Now the brain does more than reconcile subtle inputs with ongoing activity, right? We want these networks to be able to do things like perform tasks or behave like real neural circuits in the biological system. So what we want to do is to be able to train these recurrent neural network models to have task specialized interactions. Or we want to get away from the randomly connected J matrix to something that is specialized to, to do a task. And that's going to be the subject of the second lecture today. Now I want to conclude by thanking our friends and colleagues who've made this tutorial possible, as well as all the attendees. I want to ta thank members of my lab, uh, people that have helped us get this far, um, including Eve, Mehrdad, Meming, and Larry for helpful comments. I want to thank the program committee and chairs uh, of COSINE, particularly the tutorial chair, for giving me this opportunity. And I want to thank the fearless team of TAs, whom I trust will be working alongside you to solve these um, hands-on exercises next. I also want to thank our funding sources for their faith in our ideas. Thank you.